and welcome to GameSack. Analog is back with another system, this time to cater to lovers of handheld games and is finally releasing here at the end of 2021. It's called the Pocket and it retails for $199 US dollars. $200 for this? Well, let's check it out. On its own, the Pocket lets you play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games using FPGA cores. With some optional adapters, you'll eventually be able to play Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket Color, and Atari Lynx games. It has a 3.5 inch LCD screen with a resolution of 1600 by 1440. That's pretty high, and you may be wondering why use a screen with such resolution for the types of games that it plays. I'll get to that in a bit. Regardless, the screen quality is quite good and everything looks very sharp. There are four unlabeled buttons on the face of the unit, two of them concave and the other two convex, just like the Super Nintendo controller in North America. Not everyone's going to agree, but I actually really like that. The D-pad isn't as tight as you'd find on, say, a Game Boy or Game Boy Color, but again, I really like this D-pad. It and the buttons are super easy to press. It does have a hair more travel, so that may or may not affect Tetris champions. I'm no champion, so I couldn't tell you. All I know is that I like it. There are also two shoulder buttons on the back of the unit. These feel okay, but are perhaps a touch small. That's what she said. There's also three super tiny buttons towards the bottom middle of the unit. The left one is concave and acts as the select button. The middle one is the analog button, which you use for the menu and other features, and the right one is convex and acts as start. On the left side, you've got your volume up and down buttons, as well as the green power slash standby button. The cartridge slot isn't actually much of a slot, as the connector is right there at the top without a dust flap or what have you. You'd think that the cartridge wouldn't be very secure, but it actually feels really tight in there without much wobble. Again, that's what she said. Sorry. Your fingers can sometimes touch the cartridge when pressing the shoulder buttons if you're not careful, but so far it hasn't jostled the card enough to cause any glitches. There's also a slot for a micro SD card that can be used for various things, but Analog says it needs to be formatted to FAT32. Anyone remember FAT32? I tried using a card formatted for XFAT to update the firmware because F the police. It worked fine, but Analog says they want FAT32, so do this at your own risk, I guess. It also comes with a USB-C cable for charging. Analog states that the typical battery life is about 6 hours if you keep the screen at the default 75% brightness. Mine was 50% charged when I got it, and it took quite a bit of use before it finally died. I'd say that Analog's estimate is pretty close. Powering it up, you're greeted with a menu. The first item lets you play whatever cartridge you have plugged in. But the selection I'm interested in talking about now, of course, is the settings. Under Systems, you can select one of the four systems currently supported and adjust various options. In here, you can play with the video, audio, control, and hardware settings. Under Video, you have your choice of different color palettes and display modes. That's right, I said palettes. Anyway, for example, selecting Original DMG under Game Boy gives you a look that's pretty close to the original Game Boy, just without the blur as the screen scrolls. This is where the super high resolution screen comes in, as it can now draw a very convincing LCD grid pattern as needed, and I've got to say that it looks incredible. You can also select from different hardware models to mimic their look as well, or just keep it all turned off. The screen runs at the exact refresh rate of whatever system you're playing a game on. See, I didn't need 20 minutes to explain resolution and refresh rates like some channels. The frame blending option is really interesting. For example, this stage in Castlevania 2 on Game Boy has mountains that flicker in the windows. If you turn the frame blending mode on, they no longer flicker at all. This can even help you with fake transparencies like in the F-Zero games on the Game Boy Advance where the map normally flickers. Not anymore. For the sharpness, I'd advise keeping it cranked all the way up because lowering it will blur the screen, but hey, that's up to you. The size and position settings let you adjust the screen to your whimsy, but I think the default settings are pretty awesome, even if they don't fill the entire screen. For example, the Game Boy Advance is wider than the original Game Boy, so that's why it's letterboxed here. Each Nintendo Portable has a Super Game Boy Control option, thankfully, so that in effect, jump is B and attack is Y, for lack of better description. It's just how it should be. Under the hardware option, you can find various things. You can force GB mode under Game Boy so that the game thinks it's running on a Game Boy and not a Game Boy Color. On the Game Boy Color, you can select Run as GBA so the few games that have enhancements when run on the Game Boy Advance will take advantage of them. Unfortunately, graphical and sound enhancements for the Super Game Boy aren't currently supported. Hopefully, that comes in a future firmware update. 
Lastly, for the Game Boy Advance, you can enable a high quality mode under the audio. This seems to be a low pass filter to take out some of the typical scratchiness the GBA is known for. Unfortunately, it also makes it quite a bit more quiet, so you'll have to turn it up. Anyway, for an example, here's one of the scratchiest sounding Game Boy games that I can think of, Castlevania Circle of the Moon. All in all, there are plenty of options here, and although I'm not usually a big fan of handhelds, I do like what this one brings to the table, and there seem to be plenty of options to get everything looking and sounding how you want it. There are also tools you can use, which I'm not truly equipped to review very well. Nano Loop here allows you to make some music with the device. Create yourself some rock and beats like I'm doing here. Your talent is the only limit, and mine is quite limited at this time. GB Studio allows you to make homebrew games with the help of a PC app, or at least I think. Here's an example of a game called Daedalus that someone else made with GB Studio. Maybe you can do this too. Playing the games here is generally a good experience. You can press the analog button during gameplay to get to the menu to adjust things, but keep in mind that this does not pause the game. Be sure to pause it in-game before you press it. You can tap the green power button to put it into sleep mode. You can even remove the cartridge from the system, put it back in, and you're good to go when you tap it again to wake it up. This makes me think that it would be somewhat trivial to add save states, which I'm sure is coming in a future firmware. The newest firmware now has a beta save state feature where you can save your state by pressing the analog button and up to save your state and analog and down to load it. Only one save state can happen at a time and if you power the pocket down, it goes away. I'd like to see this updated so that it writes the save states to the SD card if possible. Still, it's pretty crazy to be able to do this with a real cartridge and not a flash card. The pocket can even run EverDrive cartridges just fine, which is great. However, the sleep function does not work with flash cards. The games all seem to run great so far with faithful video and sound. I did encounter some audio issues with Metroid Zero Mission, but they already had a new firmware update that seems to have fixed this before I could even report it. So be sure to update your firmware. Okay, now I've seen most of the capabilities and performance of the basic unit. It's amazing this thing only costs $199 and has a screen of this caliber. But wait, there's some optional accessories that you can get that I want to show you. I think this might be how analog makes up some of the cost of the pocket. First up, let's check out the Game Gear Adapter, which is already available for $30. I'm rounding up a penny on these prices, by the way. If you're incredibly smart, you've already figured out that this lets you play Game Gear games on the pocket. And it does so quite well. The default screen looks bright and colorful. You can change the screen to the original GG or original GG+. This gives you the LCD grid and it looks kind of washed out, but nowhere near as bad as the original Game Gear screen. The only bad thing, if you can even call it that, is that the cartridge sticks up higher than the unit itself. Unfortunately, there aren't any options for the controls here yet, so you jump and attack with the equivalent of the B and A buttons. This makes me sad as it just doesn't feel right, but I'm sure they'll fix it, right? Beyond that though, it looks and sounds fantastic. It's nice to finally be able to play the Game Gear on something with a decent screen without having to mod the original clunky unit. One thing you may want to keep in mind for now is that if you use a Master Gear adapter or play a game like Castle of Illusion that runs in Master System mode, the screen will be too big and cropped. I don't own any of that stuff though, so you'll have to check out My Life in Gaming's video. <sighs> I'm sure this will be fixed sometime in the future though. There's also a screen protector that you can get that's made of tempered glass for $16. It even comes with a wet and dry cloth for installation and upkeep. You can also get a transparent hard plastic case to transport your pocket around. This will set you back $30. There are also several MIDI cables you can use with the Nano Loop app that's built in. These are $20 each and you can get a pocket to MIDI in cable, a pocket to MIDI USB A cable, and a pocket to analog sync cable. You can also get a link cable for head to head gameplay. 
Analog seems to be pretty serious about the music making capabilities of the Pocket that go far beyond what I showed you earlier. This is super cool, and I'm curious to hear what kinds of music people are able to make with all of this stuff. Last up is the dock. This will cost you an extra $100, but for me, it's essential. What does it do? Well, simply put, it charges your pocket when you set it on it. Isn't that incredible? We are truly living in the future. Oh wait, I guess it does have some other minor features that I should mention. It has an HDMI connector so that you can play your games on the big screen in 1080p. That's really awesome, and it makes the games easier and more comfortable to play, at least for me. You can also connect controllers via USB or even wirelessly. So far, I've had the best luck using a PlayStation 4 controller. In the menu, you can go in and see that there's a grayed out option that you can't select for button mapping that will be available in the future. I can't wait. But the PlayStation 4 controller's configuration mirrors the pocket itself pretty well. Still, I'd absolutely love to be able to hook up my Sega Astro City mini controller to the USB port and map it. Right now, the firmware for the dock, which has its own firmware, mind you, is pretty basic. Before you start the game, you can play with most of the normal options you can in portable mode. However, you can't engage the display filters like the LCD overlays. I hope that they add these in the near future because I think they'd look great on my TV as well. Frame blending mode can't be engaged yet either. It also doesn't currently work with Analog's DAC thingy, so you can't output the video to your CRT. But hey, who knows what the future holds. You can adjust the size and position, but since you can't currently call up the menu while the game is running, you need to do it all blind before you play the game. The default setting has the game fill the screen vertically. However, you can set the size to perfect integer scales, 7x for the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Gear, and 6x for the Game Boy Advance. These will all give you a slight black border on screen. Even though it's pretty basic right now, the games all still run great via HDMI. The Super Game Boy Enhanced games still play in regular Game Boy mode here for now, but at least the Super Game Boy controls carry over. Except for the Game Gear, of course. The weirdest thing about this is that Analog wants you to physically remove the pocket from the dock anytime you want to change cartridges and then reinsert it and power the pocket back on. Still, I can't wait to finally be able to play my Neo Geo Pocket Color cartridges on the big screen. Another thing I want to say about the pocket is that when you update the firmware, you don't have to reset all of your preferences. Oh god, thank you! All in all, I feel that the Pocket really delivers. Usually these things are pretty buggy when they're first released, but right now there are no glaring issues. Sure, some features still need to be added, and they will be, but what we have here is already really good. So is this thing worth $200? Uh, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's really up to you, but I sure think it is. Of course, the optional accessories definitely do add to the cost, but maybe you don't want all of those. Maybe you don't want any of them. For me, the dock is essential, as are the various cartridge adapters for the other systems. And once this thing gets jailbroken, it's gonna run cores from all sorts of different platforms. So who knows? Anyway, are you thinking of getting a pocket? What do you think of it? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Who needs this thing when you can have the best portable system? The VR Troopers Game Wizard! Marvel at AAA titles like Ryan's Challenge! Wow, Ryan, you are challenging! Or step up to the pinnacle of entertainment, Jeb's Rescue! Hold on, Jeb, I'm gonna rescue you. I'm gonna rescue you real good like you'll see. Get the VR Troopers Game Wizard today! Yeah, I don't think so.